Barış Gazi Selam, benim ismim Marcel, hem Modern Tatar Ninja Podcast'ına hoş geldiniz. Today we have our first episode in English and our guest is Aynur Amgren, Swedish Finnish Tatar, an associate professor at the University of Oulu, a historian and just a very interesting person. We talked with Aynur a lot on the Tatar history in Finland but also a little bit in Sweden, their own understanding of who they are, but also the understanding of people around, of what Tatar is in general for them. In general, we try to cover the whole history of Finnish Tatars up to current times. And I think our conversation got really interesting at some point so i hope you all enjoy it and don't forget that you can always support our podcast by putting five stars and also donating for the production of it thank you hello everyone today is our first podcast in english and we have a very interesting guest it's Ainur Amgren a researcher in the history of Finnish Tatars, but not only, who made several interesting works on the overall history of Finnish Tatar diaspora within Finland. And yeah, today we will be talking about Ainur, about her research in general, past, present and probable future. Yeah. Hi, Ainur. Salam, Isamises. Isamises, Isamises. So maybe uh, to start with, you can tell us who you are, because your name is Turkic name, but your surname is Swedish. And uh, I just scrolled through your CV and I saw that you also studied in Malmo in Sweden uh, and you're working right now in Finland, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's right. I was born in Sweden. But my parents came to Sweden from Finland in the 70s. So uh, my parents are Finnish and Finnish Tatar. So I have some Tatar heritage on my grandfather's side of the family. And we have also lived in Germany. And uh, I have lived in Finland and Sweden several times <laughs> in my life. So it's, we have been moving around the Baltic Sea a lot. And uh, maybe this is also the reason, probably the reason why I've always been interested in history and literature and especially national myths and uh, ethnic stereotypes. So I first studied uh, literature and then history. And uh, that's when I lived in Skåne in, in Lund, but I also spent a lot of time in Malmö, that's true. And uh, I came to Tatar history relatively late. But as you mentioned, you are Finnish, but also Tatar. Why your surname is Swedish then? <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a kind of a complicated family story. Actually, my birth surname, my father's surname is Bavautdin. And uh, I think it would be a topic for some research as well. Uh, Bavautdin is perhaps not a very common Tatar name either. I don't know. It is a, a var variant of uh, either Bagautdin or Bahautdin. But I have never seen it spelled the way our relatives have spelt it with Bavautdin. That's totally unique, I think. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> yeah, it does sound like Bavautdin or Bagidin, as I've heard this kind of uh, surnames. And there is very, like, uh, Bavautdin, I think, is a super common surname among Tatars. But and maybe transferring from uh, Tatar-speaking environment into Finnish, And then to Swedish, it kind of changed a little. Yeah, also through different alphabets and systems to, of writing. That's for sure. It's interesting because uh, I, met, uh, I met at the Eurovision party two weeks ago, a guy, and we were started talking and he told me that he's in love with Finland. And then we had some conversation and I mentioned that I'm Tatar. And he said, oh, my friend in Stockholm is Tatar too. And he is a Finnish Tatar who migrate, whose uh, grandparents migrated to Sweden. But when they were writing down uh, their nationality, ethnicity, they wrote Tatar and in, apparently in Swedish it means gypsy or Roma person. And that's how, <laughs> yeah, it, it got confused and they kind of became Roma people. Yeah, it's, it's uh, good that you mentioned that because uh, 
it's often complicated to explain to, to Swedes about Tatars as a Turkic people because they immediately think about this uh, kind of negative word for Roma people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you came mostly to this um, research of uh, Finnish Tatars history throughout your general studies of race, nationality, et- ethnic building. And yeah, w- was it purely this interest coming from your heritage or anything in particular? Yeah, yeah I think I needed to study history more generally and also mainly the history of the nation states uh, like nation building in Finland to be able to dare to approach this topic which felt very personal to me because I've always grown up as a, even as a child I had to explain what the Tatar was and I was extremely proud but I was also extremely ignorant so <laughs> it was a complicated situation and there was no nobody really around to explain in the way which is possible now with the internet and you can connect with scholars and uh, activists all over the world but when I was a child that just didn't exist and what I learned from my father and his parents was very limited but now I have uh, during the last 10 years connected with uh, more distant relatives who are actually very knowledgeable and also scholars and activists within the Finnish Tata community. So my own closest relatives haven't been very perhaps aware or interested in spreading the knowledge, even though they probably have had more knowledge than what they have shared. Yeah, very often when people of uh, our age are trying to search into the heritage, into the family story. It happens that uh, grandparents or grand-grandparents, they think that this is not important and it's not so interesting to talk about. And very often happens this way. It's like I found at home Dora that was written, like the prey that was written by my grand-grandmother. And it was in a very bad state. And I was like eager to sustain it and like uh, in a better conditions. And my mom was like, "Oh, why you do you need it? It's just like it's almost uh, trash. Like you don't really need this kind of thing." And yeah, but but I realized that for me it's more and more important. And what what was interesting also, we were emptying the house of my father's aunt. Uh, because she was living uh, to Tatarstan to her children from Kazakhstan. And she had lots of books. And among those books, there are Tatar books, Bashkort books, but also a diary written by her grandmother in Arabic script. Um, so yeah, yeah, now we have it. <laughs> uh, I started to learn Isko Tatar Tele, Imle, how to read it, uh, etc. But it's still kind of difficult, but maybe at one point I'll do some transliteration of those texts. And talking about your work, I looked at three, like, three works that were concerning Tatar's history, and they were super interesting to me. So their names are Our Secret Weapon, Minority Strategies of the Finnish Tatars, Imperial Complexity, Finns and Tatars in the Political Hierarchy of Races, Visual stereotypes of Tatars in the Finnish press from the uh, 1890s and 1910s. These all like super interesting works because actually even now for Tatars it's super important sometimes to identify what they are because uh, yeah people associate Tatars a lot with Mongols, people associate Tatars with Turks but also Tatars sometimes want to be white, actually. And as an activist, I get a lot of questions from Tatars, what race I am. And specifically, it's like important question for Tatars in uh, in the US uh, or on the American continent, because uh, you just get asked all the time. And yeah, they face this problem that sometimes they look white, but they don't really have white mentality, or maybe they don't look exactly white. So it gets more complicated. And that was very interesting to see in the perspective of Finland. And I guess we'll talk about that. But also I want to mention that for me, actually, Finnish Tatars uh, were a super interesting example in uh, my awakening of my Tatar identity. As I, like, I didn't think as much about me being a Tatar or a Tatar 
uh, and this being like interesting or cool. But when I was 15, I found a Finnish Tatar rock band, uh, Bashkarma, probably know them. And I was like, wow, Tatars in Finland who sing in Tatar, they're so cool and the music is so nice. And yeah, that's when I started to learn some history. How did they end up in Finland? Uh, yeah, but I never was really thinking about the ways Tatars integrated in uh, Finland. And I think it's very interesting to see through your works. And maybe let's talk about that First of all, yeah, how did Tatars end up in Finland? Like the general history <laughs> lesson. Yeah, well, of course, this was connected to the time when Finland was a part of the Russian Empire. That Finland was in a privileged position at the time because it was an autonomous Grand Duchy with its own constitution and its own laws. And so Finland had a border that it w- was guarding quite well against Russia, its own (laughs) mother country, so to speak. But uh, it was connected to Russia by railroads towards the end of the 19th century. And although some Tatars had come to Finland as part of the Russian military already earlier, there were like uh, Muslim graveyards in some of the garrison towns where the military was hosted, for example, even on the Åland Islands before it was demilitarized. There is a Muslim cemetery there. But uh, the population that became the historical minority arrived as merchants, as peddlers and traders. So it was like these Tatars from the villages in the uh, Sergach uh, area in uh, near Nizhny Novgorod, uh, Michal Tatars, uh, they somehow, some guys probably first made the first trip and then they discovered that, hey, we can take the train and we can get far to the west and there are some towns where they haven't seen us and our goods before and here we can make a profit. So they extended their trading network further to include Finland as well. And then by word of mouth, uh, by connections, many people from these couple of villages near Sergach uh, started to go to Finland. Uh, It was a seasonal trade first, so they didn't stay permanently in Finland. But in the beginning of the 20th century, they started to start their permanent businesses, permanent shops, and then also bring their families. And of course, when the Russian Revolution came, there was also a civil war in Finland, but the civil war in Russia was the decisive moment. Then many of them started to permanently resettle in Finland because uh, they realized that with the Soviet system, they wouldn't be able to continue this cross-trade, cross-border trade anymore. So they had to decide whether to go back to to Russia, uh, to their villages, or to stay in Finland and bring their families. So it was a kind of traumatic event because they were not used to having to decide like that. They were used to being able to travel and always come back to their villages. Yeah, and those were mostly the traders, people who were selling textiles, I think, right? Yeah, and first, and they managed to find a kind of a market corner where they could become quite successful because they had trading contacts over the Baltic and uh, they were also Misha Tatars in Estonia and uh, also basically it's there is a fascinating biography or autobiography by Hassan Hamidullah which it has has been published by Kadri Bedvetin who has translated it to Finnish and it's in Finnish and Tatar it's a massive book and uh, he is telling the story exactly like it happened to him and how he after settling in Finland he wanted to go to Turkey instead and then he traveled with his wife and his baby in 1920s Eastern Europe by always in every town trying to find out are there Tatars here so they can help us (laughs) and quite often he could find other Tatars and of course in Turkey he also connected with Tatars who had come there so he knew that through these connections that they had always been using in the Russian Empire as well they could manage they could uh, start trade anywhere practically because there were always Tatars there to help yeah it's very interesting because this uh, community feeling is very strong among Tatars Uh, I always like to compare it also to Jewish people because in a sense uh, there are many similarities 
And uh, yeah, I love Jewish history in general. And uh, when I was thinking of Tatars as a diaspora, I was always thinking of them very similar to Jewish people in many senses. Because one of the things that unites them is religion very often. And yeah, they create schools uh, wh when they migrate somewhere. But also, um, yeah, this very strong family connections. Uh, it, like as an example, could be also Kazakhstan. We have uh, a population of 200,000 Tatars, but still Tatars in Kazakhstan are very often Russified. So uh, they speak Russian, uh, but still it, uh, they're very proud to be Tatar very often. And even in small towns like mine, it's of 60,000 people. There is around 800 Tatars maybe. And we make uh, one of the biggest uh, holidays, uh, Sabantui, in the town. And everyone comes and helps. And everyone celebrates this Tatar event just because this, like, less than 1,000 people are organizing it. And all the families bring something together. And, yeah, it's always this community. But so Misharolar, they came from Nizhigarodska oblast. And they're actually indigenous people of this region. Because, uh, like, my parents, my dad calls them forest Tatars. It's, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad. That's so funny because, I'm sorry, I had to interrupt because Urman, Urman, according to my relatives, was what they called a single tree. Because there were so few trees there. Of course, there had been forests there, but they had been chopped down uh, in the early 19th century. But uh, Urman was just a couple of small trees. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, so they migrated to Finland and their Tatar is actually a little bit different as they speak Mishar Tatar. And yeah, you can hear that when you listen to modern Finnish Tatar speaking and it's kind of combined this Mishar Tatar together also that that was reserved in the 19th century together with uh, some f Finnish, I guess, accent that comes in. And it's still a big population of Tatars living in Sweden right now, right? Well, it has never been a very big population, but I sometimes say that they are they are much bigger than their physical size. <laughs> they are overrepresented everywhere, like in sports, in society, culture, everywhere you can find Tatars. But often because of this perhaps ability to adapt, they are not very noticeable always, but when you know, you can find them <laughs> everywhere. Uh, so approximately 1,000, never more, I think they have been. So it's a very small population, even in a small country like Finland. It's interesting that you say that they're very noticeable because I heard similar thing about Tatars in Xinjiang, in China that it's a population of around 3,000 Tatars. And like in big China, with like 2 million Kazakhs living of Xin in Xinjiang, like several millions of Uyghurs, some Kyrgyz people, and still Tatars manage to always be on some high position to work in academia or do something. Yeah, and uh, maybe you know Albert Bustana? Yes. He, yeah, he is a very interesting person doing Islamic studies. And he one, uh, said in one of uh, his articles that Tatars have this blem, like this uh, concept of Tatarness that it should include Ghalim and Bulem, the knowledge that the Tatars should be knowledgeable. And it can be traced also through the uh, lullabies or things that you say to your children when you're kind of programming them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but let's get back to uh, the point when Tatars arrived to Finland. Uh, at that point, in F Finland was not very diverse uh, ethnically, if I understand correctly. Uh, in hindsight, perhaps. But back then, uh, Finns were convinced that they were too diverse <laughs> and something had to be done about it. So basically, there was a, a large minority that spoke Swedish and there was this conflict, linguistic conflict between uh, the Finnish-speaking majority and the Swedish-speaking major minority, which was actually represented in all the classes in society, but there was a dominance uh, in the higher classes of Swedish speakers. So there was a, a conflict about that. Uh, and Finnish had already become a, an official language in the country, but uh, it was still strong activism around Finnish uh, to promote it and to make people change their names and so on. And there was also, of course, the Sami minority in the north that was uh, 
an object of colonialism at the time and uh, didn't have much visibility in the public debate or representation. And then, of course, the Roma minority, which also has a bit longer roots in Finland, they came in the in the 16th, 17th century, but they have always been in a difficult position in comparison to the Tatars. And the, then the Jews, which were also a very small group, uh, but similar to the Tatars, they came from the Russian Empire, they were urban, but they were much more limited because Finland had very restrictive laws on Jews until uh, independence. And uh, this is a whole a whole other story, but it was one of the most conservative countries in Europe at the time uh, in, in terms of, of restrictive laws against Jews, what kind of professions they could uh, practice and so on. So for the Tatars, the Jews became very close neighbors. And when uh, both Jews and Tatars could, could apply for citizenship after independence, it seems that they exchanged knowledge and information for how to deal with Finnish bureaucracy because I've seen something, some similarities in their applications, uh, citizenship applications and so on. The history with Finnish and Swedish, like maybe let's talk a little how they came to the point when Swedish more represented in a high society uh, and Finnish was not as as popular among people, uh, not considered to be a very maybe beautiful or needed language. Why Swedish was on such a position, even though it was Finland? Well, before Finland was uh, conquered by Russia, it was part of the Swedish Swedish kingdom. And back then it was uh, rather an ordinary part of the kingdom. It didn't have a particularly special position. And indeed, it suffered a lot because of the wars between Sweden and Russia. But uh, it was kind of comparable to Norland in Sweden. So let's say it was not especially oppressed, but it was not particularly privileged either. <laughs> it was like a, a part, partly urban, partly, but to a large part, agrarian country. And then there was the wilderness. So what was Finland changed a lot during, let's say, the 500 years when it was a part of a, the Swedish kingdom. So initially it was just a small area around Turku, Åbo, at the, at the west coast. And then Finland as a definition became to be extended further and further into the country. So uh, sometimes it's difficult to look at the map today and to guess how it was uh, a thousand years ago, what kind of languages people were speaking in the area and so on. Because uh, what is Finnish today was largely defined in the 19th century when it was really actively created as a national language. But uh, it was already used in the Middle Ages by common people and also in uh, re in religious use, by imperi preaching and so So at that point, we could say that Finnish people were also confused with their identity in the sense that they could not call themselves fully white or fully European as they were still under very much Russian influence, but also their language. It relates to the Finno-Ugric language group. And very often Finno-Ugric people are, I don't know, people try to search for the traces in Mongolian heritage, so they're considered more Asian. And from wor your works, uh, it, it becomes kind of clear that Finnish people are trying to go up this in this uh, European racial hierarchy to prove others that they're white enough to be European, uh, yeah. And Tatars kind of helped them in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a way, uh, it, it was first, uh, first the whole mess was uh, caused by a Finnish uh, linguist in the early 19th century who wanted to find the language family that Finnish belonged to. And of course, back then they knew that there was a finno ugric connection. And he went to Siberia to study this uh, peoples that lived really far away, and he was convinced that the Altai Mountains was the origin of, of both Turkic and Finnish, Finno-Ugric people. So he was really ex uh, excited about his discovery, and he said that now we are part of a big family, we are not alone anymore, we have these uh, millions behind us. And uh, uh, it, there was even a secret political idea behind that, because he wrote to one of the main, the main national philosopher of Finland, 
Johan Wilhelm Snellman. And uh, it was a secret letter that was not delivered by Russian mail service, but by secret courier, uh, that he was sure that in the future there will be a rebellion by all these nations that have been oppressed by Russia, and there will be the Poles and the Turks, and he really meant all the Turkic people by saying Turks. And they will rise up against Russia, and then we will cheer them on from our swamps. <laughs> and, and then Finland will become independent, like, on the side, <laughs> when nobody's noticing. But uh, this was, of course, very radical at the time, because the majority of the Finnish elite at the time did not envision independence at all. They were more... They were quite happy with the privileged position they had in the empire as so their autonomous grand duchy. So it became much more later in the late late 19th century, early 20th century, that Castrén's ideas were rediscovered and, and became inspirational for Finnish uh, nationalists. At that time, it was also problematic that Castrén thought that Finnish was, that through language relationships, there was also a blood relationship with uh, Asian peoples, like uh, very far away peoples, like the Mongols, for example. So then there was this other scholar who was, I actually am very fond of him, uh, Ramstedt was his name, and he explored uh, Mongolian language and he traveled a lot to Mongolia and actually Mongolian nationalists also contacted him uh, in their independence struggle and wanted advice from him. So he was actually popular there, but he was also kind of trying to prove that Finns were not related to Mongols or even to Turks through his linguistic studies. But this was always used as proof of not being related genetically as well. So today it seems like a very problematic way of mixing language studies and uh, and uh, some sort of... Of course, they were, didn't study genetics back then. But of course, we know that these things are not related today. And actually, they knew it back then too, because they had lots of examples. But still, it was used as a proof that... Finns were white, and uh, Ramstedt even said that Finns are probably the whitest people on earth. Looking at other Europeans, they are not white enough compared to us. Of course, it was a joke from him, but it was repeated by the press as, as a truth, because a professor said so. Yeah, but it's funny to think of it right now, because in the world, Scandinavia, Sweden, Finland, considered really like to be the whitest places on the earth. And it's funny to think that at some point Finnish people were unsure that they're white enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, especially in contrast to the Swedes who were really considered by almost everyone at that point in the early 20th century to be the whitest people on earth without contest. But for the Finns, it was important to distance themselves from the Swedes too, not just from the Mongols, but also from the Swedes. Yeah. And at that point, if I understand correctly, in Finnish, the word Tatar or Tatara was uh, a slur, like n not a good word. There was a slur version which resembles the Swedish word for for Roma people, Tatari, so with the double T, Tatar. So that was the slur. And uh, Tatars themselves were conscious of this, of the difference between Tatari and Tatari. Of course, they could hear that people pronounce the words differently and also in different contexts use them. But I have had discussions with uh, especially older generation Finns who are unaware of the distinction that these are. One of the words is a slur and one is a, an accepted word by, by Tatars in Finland. So it's not an easy discussion. Probably like with many other ethnonyms, it's, uh, they can easily turn into slurs if they are used in the wrong way. But in the modern Finland, it's not really a slur, and it's like the, the Tatars claimed this name. Can we say that? This old word is not very well known anymore. It has basically been forgotten. And uh, yeah, but uh, I think for most Finnish people, Tatar is the normal word. And uh, if they know anything about Tatars, uh, it's probably something neutral or even positive. Mm. 
Yeah, but it's interesting how at that point uh, some of the Finnish representatives were really trying to get away from this mon- problem Mongolic heritage or connection to this part of Asian Russia, would say that. Because uh, right now, like Mongols are very often, con- your connection to the Mongols is very often considered as something not good or that bring uh, shows you as a backward person uh, because even in the context of Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, in the Ukrainian propaganda, I'd say, they very often refer to Russians as a mix of Finno you know, Ugric and Mongol people uh, and Tatars. They say, you're not even Russian, you're not Slavic, uh, Slavic enough, you're these uh, Mongols who are coming to. Uh, and also, they use Finno Ugric actually, and they use Mardva, who are also Finno Ugric people, to show their backwardness in a sense. Of course, it's done not by very brilliant people, but still it's interesting to see that uh, this connection to Mongols brings you somewhere back, like shows your backwardness. Uh, and even um, even with Tatars, modern Tatars, like with my generation, it also happens because the word Tatar is very often comes with Mongol, Tatar Mongol. And uh, even Tatars, they're trying to go away from it and they say, no, we don't have connection to that, although we kind of do, in a sense. So, yeah, it, it's just very interesting to see that it, it's still present, like it's it's still here. Yeah, I think there is a little difference in what I've seen with Finnish Tatars' attitude to the Mongol connection. That, For example, at some point, names like Genghis or, or Batu were actually in use in the Finnish Tata community. So these, I know some people who have these names and uh, it was not seen as something negative, rather something positive and uh, something to be proud of to have this uh, very far away connection. And also the same, uh, some of the same artists who were in the Bashkama band, they had this uh, Genghis Khan band as well. So they used that <laughs> as a band name. And uh, I think, yeah, there were some Finnish Tatars who moved to Sweden and they had a restaurant called Genghis Khan in Stockholm as well in the 80s. I've never visited it, but uh, I remember my parents talking about it and there was an advertisement in the in the newspaper. So I kind of had this dream of going there as a kid. <laughs> but Tatars in Sweden who came from Finland... I kind of feel like they're not present, like they they kind of disappeared. Is, is it true or or there is some community? Yeah, there used to be. Uh, Didar Samaletdin was the community leader for a long time in the 70s and 80s, so she was quite a famous as a person, but the community was always very small and then it was largely kind of swallowed up by uh, Turkish uh, immigration and uh, then the other Muslim groups that became more visible. But uh, there is a researcher in Stockholm, Simon Sorgenfrey, who has been studying Islam in in Sweden, the history of Islam in Sweden. And he has really done a great job in finding and connecting all these people who descend from these Tatar immigrants who came from Finland and Estonia at the end of the Second World War, mostly. And there were also a few, a few individuals that came earlier. And they are the ones that started the first Muslim community in Sweden in the mid-40s. So it's really interesting to think sometimes that the first Muslim community in Sweden uh, was founded by people from Finland and Estonia. So <laughs> when when Swedes are complaining about Islamization of their country, we can point to <laughs> Finland and Estonia. Yeah, that's a bit a uh, dark joke, but... <laughs> Yeah, uh, but anyway, um, I think this connection is important because it's also connected to the fact that many Tatars, like high proportion, considering the small population of Tatars in Finland, had an important position in the Finnish army intelligence, military intelligence. And this is why some of them moved to Sweden at, uh, in the 40s, because they were afraid of what would happen when uh, Finland started to negotiate for peace with the Soviet Union. For example, there was a big uh, uh, transfer of uh, military intelligence uh, uh, materials, uh, which was called Stella Polaris after the ship, where it was taken from Finland to Sweden secretly. I have seen some lists of people who were connected to this project, and there were several Tatars who had been interpreters in in the Finnish army and uh, 
there was even talk of a kind of Turkish team in the Finnish military intelligence who were using their language skills to in, in the Finnish military. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that the community was swollen at some point by Turkish community, because it's also a trend, uh, at least in some places that I know in Japan, uh, as uh, very little number of Tatars is still living in Japan. But the first Muslim community uh, in Japan was actually Tatar, and they had a Tatar mosque and uh, Mektab. And and I know people from there, Tatars from Japan, yeah. Mostly they're mixed though, but yeah, the rest still some. And they got actually taking, let's say, <laughs> the Tatar mosque is not Tatar anymore, it's Turkish now. Yes, and in Finland, I also understand uh, since the big migration of Turkish people start, uh, started, the Muslim community is more represented by Turkish people? Mm, not really, because Finland didn't have such a big immigration of uh, Turkish people as many other European countries. And they, those who came to Finland were often, well, they were either secular or, and the, most of the Tatar organizations were mainly religious. They had to have a congregation in Helsinki and one in, in Tampere. But they also had cultural associations. I think this matter of Turkishness is more, uh, it was a voluntary uh, decision that Finnish Tatars made, but it was also a source of conflict in the community because when Finland became independent and the Tatars wanted to make their organizations official with the Finnish state, um, they also wanted to have cultural organizations. And that is when they, some many decided to call themselves Turks instead because during the presidency of uh, Atatürk, Turkishness had a very positive uh, reputation in Finland, and Turkey was seen as a modernizing country and comparable to Finland because they became republics uh, around the same time. And uh, the later Finnish president uh, Kekkonen, who I said ruled for a very long time, he was very inspired by Atatürk in the 30s. He thought that he was an exemplary leader. But for this reason, and for the reason that Tatar was seen as problematic because of the connection to Russia, and Tatar was also, like you described, used as a slur for Russian. That Russians were described as part Tatar, or if you scratch a Russian, you find a Tatar, and so. So that's why it made many things easier to call yourself Turk, and it could also be connected to the pan-Turkic movement or the pan-Turkish movement where many Tatars had been leaders already before before the 20th century. So for example, some of the connections that they had in, in Turkey were these intellectuals who had moved from the Russian Empire to, to Turkey to, to participate in the Turkish nationalist project. Yeah, when you're discussing your article, the way of Tatars trying to go between this Tatar identity, Muslim identity, Turk identity, to find some something that would better represent them, you gave also a citation of Marjani about that whatever Tatars uh, will call themselves, uh, it will end up being a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think he was very far-sighted at, and it was a correct idea, but I'm still fascinated by his choice to, to pick this word Tatar and start to build a, an inclusive identity around it so that it would be a word where many people could even though they would have regional or tribal identities, they could still call themselves Tatar. Yes, it's super interesting because the discussion of what we should call ourselves is still going on. And I think you know, last year in uh, Russia, Siberian Tatars are trying to distinguish themselves. Krasian people are also distinguishing themselves from like this common Tatar ground. But also Tatars are discussing, like, my, my dad's idea is that we should be called Bulgars because he, he loves it so much. I, I have this article from from a newspaper from Tatarstan in the 90s that my dad saved. Like, on one of his travels, he went there and somehow it ended up in, like, in our hands. Uh, and it, it's a big article about why Tatars should be actually Bulgars. <laughs> and yeah, interesting how this discussion is very much is still like popular and uh, it's still ongoing. The same as uh, the discussion if we are white enough or not. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, there are 
there is such there are some like self stereotyping or auto stereotyping also that Tatars should look like this and that and sometimes uh, when I meet uh, Tatars for the first time they tell me that oh you look like a real Tatar and then I feel so validated <laughs> although it's like one grandfather <laughs> but but uh, then I also have a uh, the experience that Misha Tatars say that Misha Tatars look like this and that, that they are very tall and and fair haired and uh, and then I ask what about my grandfather who was very short and dark and uh, hmm good question <laughs> yeah it's funny because I also but I get both sometimes people tell me that I don't look Tatar and sometimes people tell me oh you're so Tatar like your face is so Tatar and usually when it's like I have red red cheeks or I don't know I'm smiling I'm like look <laughs> some kind of kind man. But yeah, I look uh, exactly like my dad uh, in many senses, and he is pure Tatar, if you can say so. <laughs> so I just tell people, yeah, that's that's Tatar. But when we try to talk about Tatars within Finland, were they also trying to prove their whiteness to some extent? Because uh, in like in your work with visual stereotypes of Tatars in Finnish press which is a super interesting work. Tatas very often come with uh, Roma people or with Jews. So there is Roma or Jew, Tatar and Finnish person and Swedish sometimes. And it's interesting how they uh, present Tatar people in there. It, it's like they're trying to make this person very Asian, try to put some tubete. <laughs> and yeah, uh, we're Tatars maybe trying to go away from uh, this Asianness uh, within Finland or not really? Oh, that's a complicated question. I think the Asianness in the Finnish cartoons is uh, from the eye of the beholder because there are some complaints in the newspapers later than Tatars start to wear Western clothes or more Western looking clothes that now they have changed their skin. But back home, they will put on their Eastern clothes. But somehow that change of clothes makes them stop looking so Asian as they are drawn. So it kind of changes their facial features as well. Uh, there is a really nice drawing, which I couldn't include in that article because it's after independence, from a Swedish language women's magazine. The author drew a portrait of a man that she met on the train and she evidently found him very, very attractive. So she wanted to find out where he came from because he was so exotic looking. He was so dark. And that's when Finns think you are exotic looking. And dark doesn't need to mean that you have black hair. It could be that you have like slightly darker colored eyebrows <laughs> and then your hair can be like your hair, for example. <laughs> but uh, uh, then... It, she found out that he was Tatar and he very patiently explained to her that no, he came from the east and not from the south. But she insisted on the south. <laughs> he must be a southerner. And how does he manage in this cold country and so But it was a charming article because it was a completely different uh, stereotype that uh, Tatar was dressed up in. Like instead of this uh, Asian uh, peddler, uh, he was now an exotic southerner who was almost uh, like she almost wanted to protect him because he was so vulnerable in this cold country. <laughs> but I think the earlier drawings were also based on the very young men who were mainly doing the hard work of going around and selling goods. So they often were so young that they didn't have a moustache like their fathers or uncles who sent them out trading. And that's where they were drawn without any facial hair and perhaps more. Asian looking because they exaggerated their eyes. That's just one theory I had because like Hassan Hamidullah, for example, he he was one of those very young guys who was sent by his uh, dad and his uncle to, to go out to people's farms or to the markets to trade. And I sometimes think that that must have been a kind of stressful experience in the beginning when you are in a country where you don't speak the languages, and there are people with big knives hanging from their belts around you, and they might not like you because you come from Russia and so Yeah, but it's interesting because I think if you look at Tatars, and let's just give them European clothing, costumes, and they would be very easily assimilated within the society, even in such a white country as Finland. But they still chose to create this uh, community 
uh, not to assimilate, but to sustain this Tatarness within themselves. And like they consciously chose to be called Tatar uh, and consciously chose to represent this community within Finland and fight for their rights as a minority. Uh, and that's also very interesting. And you're actually, one of your works is Our Secret Weapon, Minority Strategies of the Finnish Tatars. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's a lot uh, also about that. Yeah, but what made Tatars a success story, as, as you call it, um, success story of a minority? That's uh, that's not really my term, but that's from uh, Finnish historiography on the Tatars. So here's a book by... Antara Leitzing, a Finnish historian who has written a lot about the Tatars in Finland, he uses the term uh, success story a lot. And when I have followed his, his work later, I have noticed somehow a change in his tone that in his later writings he has been increasingly frustrated that nobody knows about this success story, that there is this other story, that they are a silent minority and he wants them to be vocal and to tell about the experiences so that other people can learn from these experiences. And uh, for some reason, I feel a bit annoyed when a historian from who is kind of not Tatar himself, I know he has connections to the community, is telling them what to do <laughs> as if they are one entity that that can decide that, okay, let's now educate the Finnish people about us because that's also what they have always been doing and that's why I argue that they are not have never been a silent minority uh, they have actually taken their place in the public discourse but in a country like Finland where there's a very strong narrative today that Finland is or should be homogenous it's somehow difficult to get people to stop and listen to these stories from the minorities and perhaps today there is more openness and awareness because I've noticed that now there's there are more requests of coming to different events telling about Tatar experiences. But, but it has been like that at various times in the past as well. Like in the late 70s, there was a kind of boom in minority awareness in Finland. But then it ebbed out during the 80s and then it came back in the 90s. And there are like these waves of becoming aware that oh, we have um, historical minorities in our country. Maybe we can learn something from them. Yeah, I see in Sweden right now a lot being talked about Roma people. Like I see books, I see documentaries just in public spaces, some kind of posters. Uh, and what surprised me also, I don't see anything about Sami people. Maybe it's just my personal experience, but yeah, it's very rare that I see anything about Sami people. And yeah, I was just kind of interested why there, I, I don't see the representation. And I like, as a person who loves minority, I would say that uh, I was trying to meet some minorities uh, within Sweden and I live in a big city of Gothenburg. And so far I just met one person who is Finnish, uh, but indigenous Finnish from Sweden. Yeah, f I think from northeast somewhere, and they speak this old version of uh, Finnish also, when Finland and Sweden got separated. But but yes, and why I say I'm surprised about Sami people because there is this huge history of racial anthropology, how they were suppressed, suppressed, put in the boarding schools, and recently Swedish Church apologized for that. But if we talk about Tatars within Finland and maybe also Sami people within Finland. Of course, they're different. But could we ever say that Tatars at some point were oppressed as a minority or not really? Not in the same way. They were able to use resources in a completely different way to, for example, finance their schools. Uh, they tried to start their own school very early on in the, in the 20s, 30s. But if I understood correctly, they have always been trying to get uh, authority permission and also financing, pro trying to get financing from the Finnish state, if any, available. Uh, but when they figured out that nothing would be coming, they turned to other resources like community, uh, of course, but also in the 50s to other Muslim uh, nations. So there were these appeals for financing, for example, when the when the Helsinki mosque and community house was, was built. 
So, and back then it was not controversial in, in Finland. Of course, today there are big discussions. Every time there's a plan to build a big mosque in Helsinki, then the question is that where does the financing come from? Is it some scary Muslim <laughs> state that will <laughs> finance it and then pull the strings behind the scenes? But back in the 50s, 60s, uh, this was totally uncontroversial in Finland. Uh, it was more like nice and exotic that the crescent moon is rising above Helsinki, the newspapers would write, and then they would be happy about Helsinki becoming international. And, and there were newspaper articles about which, was it money coming from Pakistan or some other country? It was a positive thing that Finland was becoming international. And it's ra rather interesting to see because uh, during the Cold War, Finland was kind of isolated and wanted to remain like that. So there was not much immigration and uh, there was especially strict uh, policies against uh, migration from the Soviet Union because Finland didn't want to be seen as harboring dissidents. So, so um, on the other hand, there was this uh, wish for multiculturalism. Mm, okay, and I guess Tatars were quite a good minority for that because they're well integrated enough. So they spoke Finnish. They were quite integrated in the economic system of Finland, paying taxes, but also they had, had this spice, <laughs> spicy thing of them being Muslim and having different names. Yeah, and there were Tatars who managed to have quite important positions as, uh, for example, as uh, uh, facilitators in the contacts, diplomatic contacts between Finland and, and the Muslim states in the Cold War era. And uh, speaking of uh, other minorities, uh, Tatars and Jews were collaborating also. In, I remember you mentioned uh, similarities in religion and when there were legal matters that concerned, uh, for example, food or circumcision, then uh, Tatars and Jews would unite and appeal together to politicians that we have this common interest and please listen to us. Uh, I've heard uh, really interesting stories about this from members of the community who were active in the 60s and 70s, but it hasn't really been, there hasn't really been serious research on it. It's mostly on a kind of, I think it, now is the time to do these interviews and collect the information and somebody has to do it. I hope it's not me, but, <laughs> but maybe it is. <laughs> Your PhD students. Yeah, but uh, I'm also really fascinated by these uh, connections between the minorities because it was also on a, friendly organizational level. For example, the sports organizations had uh, football matches together, Yoldus, the Tata sports club, and uh, Maccabi, the Jewish sports club. And uh, from people who participated it, in it, I've heard that Finns wanted to come and watch these games because it was a chance to see real European football, <laughs> because it was more passionate than the <laughs> Finnish way of playing. <laughs> if we come back to this success and really call a story of Tatars as a success? Because uh, is it really a success? Let's, <laughs> let's talk about that. Uh, do modern Finnish Tatars speak Tatar? And um, yeah, in general, do they identify themselves as Tatar? Is this identification as Tatar is as important? Like in Kazakhstan, I would say it, it's still very important. For us, having Tatar name is one of the most important things because within Tatarstan, within Russia, it's quite common that sometimes Tatars end up having Slavic names. And for us, it's ridiculous <laughs> because this is one of the main ways to identify another Tatar. And yeah, it, it's the way to go. Uh, even though we are living in, among lots of Turkic people, Uzbek people, Kazakh people, there is still distinguishment uh, of the names, like which ones are actually Tatar. Yeah, and still people are quite proud. I would say. Is, it, is there anything similar <laughs> within Finland or not really? I would say that there is, but there is some sort of contradiction as well. I think many, if you, if you would ask the older generation, people born in the 50s or 40s uh, would say that uh, it's a pity that the young people are not interested and so on and so forth. But I also know from young people who are the grandchildren and great-grandchildren grandchildren of these generations, that they want to cultivate their Tatar identity, but in new ways, in ways that they feel are more, more topical today and that they can use also to connect with other people who 
and tell them to show them that their rich heritage, but their new interpretation, for example, through art. Yeah. Yeah, and by that I probably guess that religion is not playing as a big of a role. Like if if we talk about past in a sense that very often the place to meet would be the mosque or the maktab or some kind of sun- Sunday school. And right now, as people tend, to, do people tend to be less religious? Let's say, as it, it, it is a trend among many Tatar communities in different countries. There are religious activities, and I think the religious communities are the ones that have kept the the community together mainly. And then, of course, the cultural organizations. But the religious communities are the ones that where you turn to when you have uh, the big celebrations in your life and so on. Of course, then there is the question of Islam, because I think for Tatars in Finland, it's important for them to show that their Islam is their own. It's not to be confused with other groups' Islam. And that's when it perhaps becomes something that the majority doesn't perceive at all or doesn't appear to be important to them. But it is, I think it is more important than it appears on the outside. To many people. But does it happen in any way that uh, they're trying to say, look, we are good Muslims, we have been living in uh, here for so long, and these radical Muslims are coming from somewhere else and their way of Islam is different? Could, could it be like that? Because sometimes I see it like this, <laughs> uh, honestly. Yeah, I think there is such, a, such an idea. Perhaps they wouldn't say it so directly, but uh, yeah, there is certainly... Something I have a friend in Sweden who um, is a scholar of religion, religious studies, and he made an interview study with Tatars in Finland, and he discovered that many of them mentioned religion as the main component in their identity, and they were of different ages, different generations. So often in Finland, I think Tatars have often emphasized their language and their identity as a cultural linguistic community because that's something Finns understand. They will understand the struggle for your language, for your culture and the need to preserve it and to develop it. But religion would be more controversial so that's where you keep a low profile and don't speak too much about it because then it would appear that you are trying to proselytize. Yeah, and I think sometimes I personally notice myself that me being uh, white passing and saying to others that I'm a Muslim, others relate to this, my part of Muslimness, my, my, like, my religious identity, as not as important, not, not as bad uh, as if it would be a person of color who would say that he or she is a Muslim. Because it's very difficult to get away from this Islamophobia that is going on right now within uh, Scandinavian countries and in general, Europe. Yeah, and one example of this would maybe be the Tatar community in Tampere that has renamed their, they used to be the, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact term, but, but the Tampere Islamic Congregation, and now they are the Tampere Tatar Congregation. So they re- removed the Islam from their name and put Tatar there instead. But the, it's a religious a community, but for Tatars only. Mm, interesting. Yeah, interesting also because in Poland with Lipka Tatars, their community is still very Muslim and based uh, on t- their religion. And when there was a immigrant crisis, refugee crisis between Belarus and Poland, and lots of Muslim people tried to cross, and some of them died uh, crossing through the like lakes because the border, it was winter. Uh, the Tatar community collected the money and they buried those people on them, yeah, in the Muslim way. Still very interesting because Lipka Tatars, uh, they have a very, very old history of living in Poland and they did not really sustain the names. Uh, Their names are mostly Polish now, but still this religious identity is very strong in the community. And for, uh, you mentioned that young Tatars, like the young generation of Finnish Tatars, they want to sustain their Tatarness, but in, in a different way. And... I think it, it's very interesting because it, it's kind of a trend right now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in, in what way you see it with the example of Finnish Tatars? Uh, well, for example, I'd say there is, um, for example, a jewelry designer from Tampere originally, Ildar Wafin, Ildar Wafin. Mm. who makes re- 
You, do you know him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he once once contacted me with this idea that we should make a cookbook, but not the old dusty kind of cookbook with the old fashioned recipes exactly like grandma used to make, but to do something new about Tatar cuisine. And I'm sure he's very busy with his uh, <laughs> jewelry design. Now I really like the designs that he's showing on Instagram. But I hope also that we will be able to make that book one day because it was a great idea. I think it was a nice concept. And I'm really fond of Tatar cuisine myself because this is also not really a topic of my research, but I think it's one of the last things that disappear when you are in the process of assimilating or losing. For example, I wasn't taught Tatar language at home when I was a child, but we were always making paramets. And we were also making... Um, Laksa sorba, uh, the soup, which I did not like as much as paramats. <laughs> but uh, to fold the paramats correctly, this is something that I learned as a child. So <laughs> it's maybe the last thing that, that is preserved in the heritage. Yeah, but it, it's interesting. Yeah, f- Food plays a big role. And uh, Ildar did tell me about this book once, that he's really thinking of yeah, going somewhere with it. Uh, but he also made this jewelry collection that he called uh, Shur- Shurele or Urman. And I think it's, it's an example of this modern Tatar art that is being made uh, outside of the space of Tatarstan, but uh, in a very unique way. And yeah, I, th- I think it, it, it would be very close to many people who are trying to find that connection with their Tatarness in their own ways, like in this different way let's say because i i also for me i try to be super open and i see so many people who are just maybe one of their grandparents is tatar or someone is tatar and they had just some tatar experience and they're trying to see themselves as tatar but uh, you can often hear that oh no you're not tatar enough maybe or uh, they have internal voices that they're telling them your name is not Tatar, you're not Tatar enough. Uh, but but I'm trying to tell people very often there is no such thing not Tatar enough. <laughs> it's like if, even one grandmother is enough to be Tatar. When I hear that people had have a grandmother who is Tatar, because in Kazakhstan it's a super often case, I say so. Okay, you're Tatar now, <laughs> and we should increase the demography of Tatars. <laughs> <laughs> That somehow reminds me of a medieval chronicle that uh, was telling about these uh, Mongol conquests in Europe and mentioned a prince uh, somewhere in Galicia or so on who was forced to drink kumis. And then they told him that now you are a Tata like us. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny, but true. But in general, is Tatar exist as an existent language? Uh, is it living in Finland in any way? Because I know that Ildar, for example, he speaks Tatar and he's coming from this very old family and they, of those people who came from Nizhny Novgorod. And his brother, I think, he got married to uh, a woman from Tatarstan. So, yeah, I guess there is also some kind of practice of going to Tatarstan to find uh, a partner uh, to also help you to sustain the language in some sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There are also language courses available for this. uh, I have a good friend who is uh, Hungarian originally, but she speaks uh, Tatar so well that I get jealous. How did she learn that? She also speaks Turkish and Finnish and Estonian and everything. (laughs) And she has done a lot of research on Tatar language use in Finland and uh, uh, about what is the current situation. So we are actually publishing an article soon together on this topic. And in brief, I would say that Tatar language is well and alive, even though it's a very small community that speaks it. But there are many efforts done to make it uh, survive. And there are also many learning materials published, not just books these days, but also other resources. For example, I have this lovely children's book here. It's, uh, oh, now you can't see, but it's Su Anas by Abdullah Tukai. And... There is a CD also, so this is from the CD era, it's not that modern. <laughs> but uh, so you can listen to the Tatar language while reading it with your child, and it's both in Finnish and Tatar, so it's accessible. Uh, is it written in Latin alphabet? Yes. 
Yeah, so so this alphabet question is a problem because uh, in Finland for a long time, uh, I think the Arabic alphabet survived much longer than in the Soviet Union. So it was still used in the 50s, but then there was a decision by the community to gradually start using the Latin alphabet. But there was resistance against it as well. So there is now a huge collection, a bibliography of Tatar publications in Finland, which is not very accessible to the new generations because uh, you have to study to read it. And I was very happy to hear that you were studying because uh, I, I would I wish I could have the time as well. <laughs> it's a new trend because it's one guy who makes them. I unfortunately forgot his name, but he made a beautiful course that is available for everyone. And actually he does the online course that is super cheap. And among youngsters, uh, Tatar youngsters, it became like super popular trend to learn how to write, <laughs> yeah, write and read in Arabic script right now. Yeah, thanks to him. That's wonderful. That makes me so happy. I want to, <laughs> I want to study that course as well. I can send you the link. But it's also interesting to see what alphabets people choose to use uh, being outside of Tatarstan. Because uh, in San Francisco, uh, the Tatars of San Francisco, those are actually the ones who came from mostly from Japan through Turkey to San Francisco. They're also using a Latin alphabet uh, while writing Tatar. And I guess every community defines themselves their version of this Latin that they're deciding to use. Um, would it be more Turkish version of uh, Tatar or anything else? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think in the Finnish case here, for example, they have chosen to use many of the Turkish consonants, but then there are some own, own signs as well. So I think it's pretty clear to read, at least for me. So it's not difficult to, to pronounce after those letters. So it's helpful. But uh, there used to be a Tata course given at the University of Helsinki by Okan Daher, who insisted on that those who attend the course also are able to read Cyrillic because he would use a lot of materials printed in Cyrillic. And also it was a bit challenging course, so I, dis I didn't ever attend it, and which I of course regret now because he's retired, I think, and he doesn't give the course anymore. But uh, it, for those people who attended the course, they said that it was quite challenging because there were all these different writing systems and also different spelling and pronunciation systems. And of course, there are these conventions of the Finnish Tatar pronunciation, which is more kind of, there are some Misha influences and then there's also a lot of Turkish influences, like, and uh, especially post uh, Atatürk reforms have influenced. But then there's the old vocabulary, so you actually learn a lot of Persian at the same time, and maybe it's even an advantage to study Persian at the same time, I think, sometimes. Uh, because even though I know very little Tatar, I've noticed when I listen to some, uh, like, Bollywood songs that, oh, there are some familiar words here. <laughs> so there are these uh, Persian words that have traveled over the whole Eurasia from one side to another. Yeah, but it's interesting and that's a challenge for sure that before Arabic and Persian would be the languages that you would easily write something in. Like if you want to write a love poem, uh, you would write it uh, in Persian probably. If you want to give a comment on the Quran, then you give it in Arabic. Uh, and like right now for Tatars, it's English and Russian probably uh, as uh, the, ch the space changed. And uh, yeah, we use a lot, a lot of the words from coming from Russian or from English. Yeah, and it's a challenge to read. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there is a very nice, um, where did I put it? Um, a dictionary, which is Tata Sha Fincha So it's it's by Okan Daher and uh, a Finnish researcher, Arto Moisio. So it's really useful because there are both these words that are commonly used in in Tatar in Russian, and then what would Finnish Tatar say instead? <laughs> so you learn a lot of vocabulary from this book. Yeah, I think th there is even a website for Finnish Tatar translation. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. So uh, Finnish Tatars did a lot for their community to uh, thrive and be alive. And I'm really fond of it. And um, 
waiting for the young generation of Finnish Tatars like Ildar, <laughs> what they would bring because it, it, it develops and something new comes up. As within Kazakhstan also, I guess, uh, like uh, the war with the Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine also provoked a lot of awakening from Tatars within Kazakhstan. They're like uh, the young Tatars, I would say, started to realize more about their Tatarness in general. At least there is such a trend. <laughs> yeah, there's almost a perception like there's a window of opportunity for some kind of new action or new movements. Since I've been studying what happened in in these regions, especially in connection to Finland during the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War, it feels almost a bit spooky that there is a similar mood that before we know what is the next step, anything could happen. So there are also these uh, sometimes fantastic ideas that suddenly become possible. I really want to show a small item that is a very special uh, gift from one of my older relatives. It used to belong to her husband, who probably got it from his parents. And I'm not sure if you can see what it is. It's probably not very sharp. Can you see what it is? Yeah. Oh, it's Idel Rao. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little pin. Yeah. And uh, she wasn't really able to tell me much about where her husband or he, her husband's grandfather or father got it from. But, um, well, <laughs> I would be curious to know who made this and who distributed them. And was it some special occasion, like a celebration of the memory of the Idel Ural Republic? I just saw today that one Tatar from Sweden, her name is Aida Abdrahmanova, I think. She comes with a lot, she protests a lot, and she came with a flag of Idel Ural Republic also, because this is kind of the idea of this, how you call it, the government, the exiled government of Tatarstan by Koshapov. They are really fond of this idea of Idel Ural Republic. Yeah, so it's still a life, in a sense, just an idea. Yeah, yeah, and some of its leaders who went into exile, like Sadri Maksudi, uh, had connections to Finland, and he 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 escaped to Finland, and he spent a lot of time with the Tatar community in Finland. So uh, he even wrote in a book about Finnish language and the Czech language as examples of how Turkish could develop as a language. So he knew a lot about Finland thanks to his connections here. Also, uh, like as a Tatar activist, uh, I noticed such a thing that very often the activist or the artist, Tatar artist who are very active, they came to Tatar consciously. So they didn't really speak it as uh, children in their, in, yeah, and uh, just at some point they consciously de consciously decided to learn it or to to remember it again in a sense to revitalize in their head memory um, because it's often the case that uh, people lose the language they were exposed to it at some point and now they're kind of coming uh, to this understanding that they want to speak it on the conscious level and there are so many of this kind of people that i meet and it's super interesting and there are three Tatar podcasts that are ongoing, and they're all by people who, for whom Tatar is not the first language. And it's like, I love this trend. <laughs> so that's super interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. It's similar to many, like many people in the Finnish minority in, in Sweden who have uh, perhaps not even been the first generation to forget the language, but actually already their parents stopped speaking the language, but then they want to communicate with their grandparents. So they start to learn it or they want to teach it to their children. And uh, it's like this a kind of third generation syndrome that you go back to the roots, your grandparents. It's really fascinating phenomenon. I feel like I'm somehow part of it as well, although I haven't learned the language. I only know like a few phrases. With your work, you did enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what are maybe the projects that are ongoing in your work? And where are you working right now? Maybe some people would want to collaborate with you or get to know more of your work. Yeah, yeah 
I'm working at the University of Oulu in teacher education. So I have quite a lot of teaching in teacher education programs, which puts a bit of limit of how many new <laughs> projects I can take on, but somehow I can't stop. So now they are just, the projects keep uh, multiplying on their own. So we have some ideas in a in a project which is about bringing awareness to the Finnish public in a more popular way about minorities in the country and their experiences, and especially from an activist viewpoint, so that they are not just passive objects for like state control, or they are not just victims, or they are not just uh, curiosities from the past, but they are active participants in society, and they will be in the future as well. So I feel this is really important to get over this idea of the silent minorities or the minorities that have not actually participated in society, which is not true, I think. And uh, along with that, I would like to work more on the, for example, the Finnish Tatars activities in military intelligence during the Second World War in Finland, because they just, their names appear somewhere and they are hints and they are, but there's no overview or some, or research. And probably, probably a lot of the materials have been destroyed the documentation is probably not complete, so it's maybe not possible to, to study it, but I would still like to try. It sounds like a detective work to <laughs> go to the archive, search for Tatar surnames. Yeah. Oh, and another thing, this is this uh, um, Tatar lady who came to Finland, who was the chairperson of the Petersburg uh, Muslim Charity Association, Amina Hanem, Amina Sertlanov or Emine Sartlan, as she was called in a more Turkish sounding way in Finland. She was a really, like, uh, she was of Muslim nobility from, from Ufa originally. And she became uh, active in the Finnish Tatar community and helped them to, to legalize their status, like with the paperwork in, in Finland, because she had this experience of association work from Petersburg and other places. But... She is a mystery because at some point it seems that she became interested in theosophy and uh, then she moved out of Finland and it seems according to what people had told as oral history or in letters, private communication, that she was the first one who actually left the, the congregation, that she officially stepped out. And this was such a big shame and, and big drama back then that she, she became like a taboo topic perhaps. Because she was one of the founders of the congregation, and then she decided not to be Muslim anymore, as far as we know. <laughs> and then she moved to France, and that's where her traces are kind of lost, because she was active in a Freemason organization in France, which was mostly with uh, Russian immigrants. So probably that's where she found her community, and it was also a women-dominated Freemason lodge, which is also interesting. <laughs> that there, I, I found some like uh, notes from men who were members of the lodge and they were complaining that the women were ruling it. <laughs> so so I think it was very fascinating, but there are so few few sources about her as well that it's a bit frustrating to, to dig. But maybe you know who Renat Beckin is, the Islamologist. He, he's from Petersburg, but he has been living in Sweden now. He made his PhD in Södertörn University in, in Stockholm. And he is also very interested in Amina Hanum. So we have this hopeless project or dream that maybe we can write something about her, even though there are very few sources. It sounds super interesting. And as you mentioned, also could be even more interesting to take in general the, the story, the role of Tatar women within the even Finnish Tatar community, because very often Tatar women are ruling <laughs> in a sense <laughs> yeah there's a, a nice book which has which is an internet publication and freely available by Sabira Stolberg who is also her father uh, was Tatar and her mother was uh, Finland Swedish and she wrote about Tatar women in the Finnish Tatar community that they were actually not silent or invisible either they were very important and it's it's an interesting book because she has collected a lot of oral history and a lot of 
this sort of unofficial history from people's letters and uh, personal communication. And also in your work, one of your works, you mentioned that Tatar women initiated working in the hospitals during the war, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this was a peculiar Finnish situation because um, in, in the Finnish army, there was no role for women at the time. Women were not allowed to carry arms because uh, it was part of the ideology of the victors of the civil war in Finland that uh, this is something the Reds did and this is what we white Finns will not do. So, uh, But there was a role for women in uh, the women's auxiliary corps, the uh, Lotta Svad organization. And, uh, and this was a high status organization. It did not allow anyone to become a member, so you had to pass approval. So they did not want members who were, for example, Russian Orthodox, with perhaps some exceptions. They were suspicious of, of Jews, so there was an anti-Semitic aspect of this organization as well. But in the period between the Winter War and the Continuation War, so from the spring 1940 to the summer of 1941, they got some applications from non-Christians, which were Tata women. And they immediately accepted these applications without discussion. And then after that, they started to accept Jewish women as members as well. So for some reason, <laughs> the Tata women opened up this <laughs> gate. They somehow made the organization realize that actually we need these women as well, uh, because they seem to be very patriotic and they want to help. So they were active in, in this organization and also in civil uh, various civil tasks, civil protection during the war. That's interesting because very often in the Western view, Eurocentric view, the Muslim women are considered to be silent or yeah, not having as many rights. And I read in one of the articles actually uh, by my friend, I think, Helen Faller. She wrote a book on Tatarstan uh, as a sovereign republic. And there she mentions, I think there is a even separate chapter on women. And there she mentions that once uh, some kind of Russian came to Kazan to talk with businesswomen. And some of those businesswomen, and many of them were uh, wearing hijab or being openly Muslim. And how this Russian uh, businesswoman started her talk is like, tell me how you are getting oppressed by your men. Like how they make struggles for you. And the, the Tatars were kind of surprised. And their reply was, they're not making troubles for us. They're helping us to make our business even better. And the Russian woman like totally ignored that. And uh, then she said, oh, don't tell me bullshit. It can't be true. And it's like she, she was not even thinking that uh, it, it could not be the case. So, yeah. Uh, and what's interesting in some of the works, current works uh, by some of the, let's say, Russian speaking researchers on Tatar women, they still have this approach of looking into the history of Tatar women as someone who by default should be oppressed or should perceive themselves as, uh, even if they don't perceive themselves uh, as oppressed, they must be oppressed uh, from the side and they were made to believe that they're not oppressed. And yeah, it, it's kind of interesting to see. And <laughs> I hope more decolonized research, less Eurocentric would, would come uh, to actually dig into that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And uh, the, I sometimes get these kind of questions as well, because uh, sometimes when uh, there are Finnish journalists, for example, who went, want to make a story about uh, Tatars and a little bit of history, uh, and then they ask... Uh, or want to be confirmed in the idea that Tatars are different Muslims, these are the ones that don't oppress the women. And <laughs> all the others, of course, do, but Tatars are somehow exceptional, and that's why they have adapted to Finland, because Finns are also so equal. And I, <laughs> I always try to kind of twist their, their ideas around that and surprise them by, for example, claiming wildly that uh, Tata women, when they arrived in Finland, they were in some ways more equal than the average Finnish woman <laughs> because they were used to used to being listened to. And <laughs> and on the other hand, back then, Finnish women were also accept, expected to cover their heads in the early 20th century. You did not go outside 
And then your head covering had to be suitable to your status in society. So you should not wear a hat if you were a woman from the countryside, like a peasant and so on. So this was very, very important back then. So in a way, Finland and the Tatars secularized together step by step. There was no clash in in gender roles when they arrived. Finnish women were also expected to be obedient to their husbands, and they were not so <laughs> same as with the Tatars. But very interesting. And, and I also think that um, if the li- listeners uh, decide to read your articles, they will get many ideas about the questions that they might have. Such question as uh, why we are Tatars? Why are we being called by Tatars in general? Or are we white <laughs> or we are not really white? And that, does this concept even important for us uh, to state as it is? Or how to stay Tatar, <laughs> even though you are not being supported a lot by uh, in the outside? Uh, yeah, what could be the motivation in general? And yeah, I think uh, th- that's what I like the most. I think even though it's a history of uh, this Finnish Tatar diaspora, but but it does give a lot of answers to the current current state of Tatars as we are becoming more and more as a diaspora nation, less uh, stick to the land. Uh, as many Tatars also migrated uh, since the war started from Tatarstan, and uh, suddenly they also come back to this Tatarness and search for Tatars around, in a sense. Thank you. That Those are very kind words and very humbling words, because uh, my ambition has mostly been to just tell about the Finnish Tatars and their interactions with the majority population. It would be wonderful and extremely exciting if uh, people could find something that tells something about minorities, and especially Tatars on a global level and can be compared to other experiences as well. And it would be exciting to get feedback and comments about it. Yes, and maybe some of um, listeners will get also inspiration for their projects or whatever it would be. (laughs) Yes, and I hope I will also get to actually make a podcast uh, with Ildar and talk on his work uh, if he accepts my invitation. (laughs) Because I also think uh, it's interesting to uh, have an example of a person who is, I don't know, in what generation living in Finland, but still very fluent in Tatar. But thank you. Thank you once again for finding time in your busy schedule. And uh, in general, I actually was not uh, aware if you are Tatar or not. I thought maybe you were from Turkey for some reason, actually. Yes, and you have some Turkish heritage, but it's even nicer to know that uh, you're also Tatar and your name is Tatar. So it, it it went through the generations and not just Tatar, but a very Turkic name, not a Muslim name, but Turkic. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is really from the time when Turkic name, Turkish names were, these kind of modern Turkish names that were adapted to be as... Uh, original or ancient as possible when they were in fashion. So I have some relatives who also have the same same first name because of the trend at the time. Yeah, but also the speciality of the name Ainur is that it's um, universal. So it can be a man, it can be a woman. But in Kazakhstan, there is the case that actually the names got a little colonized by Russian language. So the name Ainur would transfer to Ainura to have the ending a uh, in the end and make it more feminine in the Russian way of saying it. Well, this is actually something I've always found very funny and entertaining <laughs> in, in my life because uh, people misgender me all the time <laughs> just based on my name or perhaps my communication style if they don't see my face. <laughs> and uh, it's very close to uh, what people perceive as Scandinavian names. So they often ask, is it an um, Icelandic name or... Or maybe they pronounce it as Einar, <laughs> so I feel like a Viking. But uh, it's it's nice to kind of surprise people. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually one of the things that uh, I love about Tatar, and I'm trying to dig into it more, how it actually influences people, because uh, it kind of changed the language itself and the naming. It changed, changes also the perception of gender as it is. Very often uh, how, how you see the world, but also 
could be a foundation for some kind of queerness. And yeah, so uh, I was asking, uh, like, I did some uh, post podcast with queers, Tatar queers, and I always ask them the question, what is your perception of Tatar in the queer context? Uh, does it happen for you to be m more queer friendly or less queer friendly? And it's always, the answer is always interesting because people actually think about that. And for them, it's important and yeah. That, that's a very interesting also topic. Yeah, speaking of Tatar and queerness, I really liked your analysis of, uh, or, or your reading of Shirale as a, as a queer uh, character. It was really fascinating to me because, uh, well, I didn't grow up with the Shirale stories as a child, but I was really impressed by Sabina Stolberg's uh, kind of semi-autobiographical novel where she's telling about her experiences of being bullied for her Tatar background in in Finland. And uh, then it's like the main character goes through lots of changes in her life and she travels finally to the original villages and and she has uh, has these uh, recurring... It's like a, a, a dream kind of experiences with Shirale as a really scary character. And, and uh, that's impressed me a lot that she managed in her novel to bring out the scariness because if you think about being tickled to death that first it just sounds silly <laughs> perhaps to me at least but it has all these other aspects as well so people can interpret it in many ways so yeah more more queer readings of Tata folklore and Tata literature I would really like to hear more there will be for sure <laughs> yeah but thank you let's end the recording and thanks everyone for listening and we will leave all the links uh, to different works of Ainur but also to the things that we mentioned that you could check them out thank you and big surah rahmat <laughs>